Sorry, I'll do it without the box. So, uh, why do I feel like we're the Three Stooges right now? Because, because we are. are. But at the yeah. end of the day, here yeah. we are. It was a very excellent and passionate <laughs> conversation. Exactly. With your wife and now. Uh, Three gun ones. Well, welcome, uh, Firehouse, whoever else may be watching this. Um, I'm Pastor Steve Trollio. I pastor uh, Firehouse Chapel, southwest side of Chicago, and uh, here today with two very special people. I'm going to introduce one and then I'll have him introduce the other one. But uh, to my far right would be uh, Melvin, and uh, known him for 39 years since he was 16 years old. And we'll talk more about that afterwards, but uh, he's been a dear friend, my little brother, uh, not so much size-wise, it's not like you're a runway model or anything, but, uh, but you know, he's been, he's always, I've always looked at you like a little brother. Yeah. And uh, so we're gonna talk about some things, and why don't you introduce? And I'm gonna introduce my dear friend, our dear friend, Chris Bayless. And uh, we are going to get into the story of how Chris came into my life and then came into your life, Troop, uh, as we talk about this. <clears throat> and we are going to show the hand of God is what we call it, right? Because we always say the hand of God. We're going to show how Pastor Steve, we, so we, we, I call him Trooper, P.S., so bear with me. I got about five names for him. <clears throat> We're gonna less than other people. Less than, yeah. <clears throat> One less than your wife, Jared. Yeah, exactly. We're going to show how God's plan, his hand, was part of all of our lives and the plan, which I always say God has a plan and has his hand in everybody's life that it opens up their heart and can see it once you get them opened eyes. So we are going to hear an amazing story that's going to unfold today. Yeah. Do you want to tell how you know Chris? Oh, I'll get in that after. <laughs> you know, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So this right Chris. off the bat. Yeah, we, we met him <clears throat> in the parking lot about an hour ago. So, Chris Bayless is retired now, ATF agent, for how many years, Chris? 30 years. For 30 years. And he is actually the ATF agent that put the RICO case against me and, and, and got me put you know away in prison for the racketeering club. <laughs> but how I met him is... Chris got in through through the Hells Angels in Rockford. He, he infiltrated them there. We lived so close to each other, you guys, in, in, the, in the towns where we grew up and around here, and we're very close in age that, you know, I was kind of became the head of the target, but we knew that we had some mutual friends, of which we found out as we became friends. Yeah. We both, lo and behold, we did. Yeah. So Chris was able to get into Rockford and, and, and get the whole thing done in that way. But when I first seen him, where I first seen him was the day, the morning of the indictment, we got our doors kicked in. Chris wasn't part of my raid, you were in Rockford. <clears throat> and now we are sitting three hours away from up here in our suburbs in a town called Peoria, Illinois. And we're in our street clothes because they just got us out of our houses. And now it's, you know, our doors got kicked in at like 5.45 and now it's about one o'clock in the afternoon. We're going in front of a, a, a judge with this indictment paperwork that they just gave us. We don't have our real lawyers there. We got public defenders and stuff. And we're sitting there, and, you know, shackled up and I'm at the table and I look and I see Chris or the ponytail and the beard. And I see him sitting next to the United States prosecutor, which I have, was already to the Fed prison once. So I knew the federal time. And I said to the other three uh, Hells Angels that were at the table with me, I said, hey boys, who's the biker looking guy that's uh, sitting next to the U.S. attorney over there in the two Rockford Hells Angels said, oh, that's uh, Chris, his, uh, his name's Chris Bayless, but he was a prospect for us. He's an ATF agent. And I know, oh, F-minus there, right? <laughs> okay, now I get it. I see where he's at, right? So I didn't know him from anywhere. I never, you know, had seen him on the streets. I didn't break, we didn't break any bread. And I became friends with this man here who, who my mom, nicknamed the coin yeah, our, our angel yeah our angel and um couldn't have asked for it, it sounds weird saying this you know but you couldn't have asked for a better guy to be, be a part of that to be arrested by because you know i was running the club for a while and there was some different atf agents that i had to cross paths with and paths with and they weren't the best guys right and not that i was the best guy but as Chris will tell you, I always try to keep a rapport with everybody. Yeah. I never was, uh, you know, uh, it was all cops person. or jerks. And it was never a person. I had so many friends of mine that were in law enforcement. I just took the other path, right? 
So nothing was personal. So then to be able to sit down and with my lawyers and, and Chris and, and our dear friend, our U.S. Attorney St. Chambers, God rest his soul, yeah. Yeah. And a great guy, and got to sit down and, and I was out of the club and said, listen, I want to plead to my charges. I want to put this past behind me. And this is what this guy got to do and step up in my life and be such an instrument and help that time. We always laugh and we say for, I was the target and we, they took it to Peoria and we put it in front of a judge that they call him the hangman, you know, Judge Mim and stuff. They stacked the deck against me to now where I was pleading guilty and gonna accept the responsibility and working on the, the, the proffer now that this man has to jump through hoops that they, you know, went through, you know, they said, okay, if this guy does the wrong thing, goes to trial, we're gonna hammer him. And now he had to flip the script and say, how can we help Mel out and get him out of here without, you know, too much drama, right? So it was, uh, you had your hands full. Yeah, no doubt about it. You were no easy, uh, <laughs> easy customer, <laughs> as far as that goes. But I think, the, I think the thing that, as far as the, the U.S. Attorney was, DOJ thought, the judge down there thought was the fact that you had started to change your life um, before we wrapped you up in the RICO. Yeah. That that was what sealed the deal, I very, think, for the judge. Uh, very important. Was, yeah, absolutely. And it was the prison calls that I used to, I used to listen to his prison calls, like when he was locked up on the state, he did a federal bit, and I would listen to his prison calls all the time. And you could tell there was starting to become a change in how he was doing what he was doing and his <clears throat> desire to continue down that path, and it was, Kind of fast. I remember my kids were little at the time, and I would have the headphones on. I'd listen to these cassettes, and they'd be sitting on my lap, and they're going, "Are you listening to that to find some clues?" And I start laughing. I go, "Yeah, I'm listening to that to find some clues about Mr. Chancy." But yeah. I think that um, I, I think as you grew, not only in your faith but as a person, um, you could definitely mm -hmm. see a shift. And I think what people don't have a real conscious thought of or understanding of the level of violence that you were involved in and that we were involved in at yeah. different times in a war with another motorcycle gang. People trying to kill you, people following us back in a cover apartment. We were in the middle of a, you know, just basically a war between motorcycle gangs. Yeah. And, um, it was hard to navigate where you were at, even as an agent, let alone being the head of the Hells Angels. So it was, uh, it was a very tough situation back then. And, and I remember Mim, Judge Mim saying, you know, at the, at the sentencing, he said, you know, Mr. Chance, he goes, I've been a judge, you know, a long time, 25, 30 years at that time or whatever. He said, I goes, I never would, was sentencing anybody <clears throat> that was part of the entity, which means, you know, part of the, I was at the club at the time, the Hells Angels, that I was gone. I was out of the club. I had just quit the club, you know, 10 months, 11 months earlier. <clears throat> after I was able to get off my parole, my first parole from state and federal time. But, you know, for him to say that, I, I, it, it dawned on me like, wow, you know, most guys, the other three guys were still in the club when they were getting every right. indictment and stuff. So, right. you know, we talked about it earlier that, you know, the change that the Lord did in my life from that first sit down is what I needed. I needed that, you know, you've been a bad kid, go sit in the corner and mm -hmm. look what you're doing. Because I used to say that I was so far in the forest, I couldn't see the trees. Absolutely. You know, I stopped a few guys from coming in the club. Jamie and Chuck, they were friends Absolutely. of ours. They were trying Absolutely. to come in the club, and I said the same for you. Right. They were looking at me like hypocritical. Yeah, and I right. said, you know, yeah. you see the good stuff. You see the, the girls and the patch and the running around and the red carpet stuff, but you, you ain't there when, when, when the brother's daughter's jumping in the casket that you were at, Monty's yeah. daughter, yeah. rubbing his hair before we yeah. close the casket, right? Yeah, it's that was not, yeah. It's just something that, you know, people ask me, and I said, how am I supposed to just, I can't just call time out. Right. Being who I was, right, Chris? Sure. You know from both sides. You, sure. you were in there. You infiltrated. Mm -hmm. You know motorcycle clubs for sure. a long time. Just, I just couldn't call a timeout and say, okay, April Fools, guys. Are we good? <laughs> yeah, well, are we good? Yeah, I'm, I'm out now anyways. Yeah. And then they'd say, Let, let's really double and get them now, right? So I was just, I had to go with the journey. Absolutely. Time, right? And uh, Absolutely. trusting in the, you know, and trusting in the Lord and, and that he would bring me to where he needed me. And, uh, and that first sit down is when I said, here I am. There I am. So it's, absolutely, it's been a good, great it's been, right? I know, and I tell you, what, I as a, I could not be more proud of your walk with the Lord. You're securing your faith. I mean, you've helped so many people. Not only uh, people that have been on the other side of the law, but also people on the side of the law. Um, yeah, you you are an inspiration to people that you know. No one's 
not worthy of God's forgiveness or, or God's love. And I think that is the... Uh, and, and, I, and I remember this, you know, me and you. So obviously, Chris and my pastor, Steve and Chara, and through, you know, through me, <clears throat> and then recently started attending the Firehouse Chapel, him and his wife, Tina, helping on Tuesday, every other Tuesday with the boxes of hope that you see you're going to see on another video we're putting out. And just became, you know, I'm watching you grow in your faith, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. In your yeah, faith. Absolutely. And, and I remember coming in, and me and you were going to speak at the college. Yeah. Years back. We are going to speak Northwestern at the Law School. And I said, Chris, sir, I said, <clears throat> when you picked me up, I said, we have to go detour. I have to see this young man by the name of Joey. He was fighting cancer. Young kid at the time, 15, yeah. 16 years old. Yeah. And he had a, a, a thing that said, no one fights alone. Joey Strong. And died. Uh, his parents wrote me, and he was a bodybuilding fan, and he loved my bodybuilding stuff. He didn't know the biker side of me, loved for the bodybuilding stuff. And I told the parents, I'm actually coming in. I'd love to meet him. <clears throat> I sent him an 8 by 10 I sent him a nice letter. You picked me up, we went to meet him. Yeah. Spent a few hours with that young man, right? Yes, yeah. dad's office yeah. in Oakland. Spent four hours. Spent four hours, yeah. I've spent four hours. Just, just, just the kid was just, he, Joey was so inspirational to us, and to see his eyes light up. So... When we were leaving that meeting, we got in the car. Chris was just retiring at the time, yeah. laying down the, the business. And listen, after 29 years of ripping and running anywhere, you're, that's your life. It's just like me with the Hells Angels, just like him. He was like now searching, like, what do I do? What? And he said to me, he goes, you know what? It's, I, I, what is it all about? What, what you were like, well, sir, I, thought was, I thought it was there. I was driving near the airport, and we'd done a presentation for one of the U.S. attorneys at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. We got done, we spoke to the young man, and I was like in my, you know, I was at the end of my career, and I was like, if I do anything worthwhile, you know, yeah. it really matter. You know, 30 years of battle damage mm -hmm. to my family, to myself, to my friends. I'm like, I don't think it was worth it. And um, I'm with you former president of the Hells Angels, who's got a bag over his shoulder, I'm dropping him off, and he looked at me with like, what are you talking about? He goes, if, and this is Mel Chancey telling me this stuff. <laughs> no, nope, and I'm no scholar, as we know. He just said, he goes, if God's only plan in this situation was for that, that young man to have four hours with us talking, if it took you arresting me, how many years ago? Yeah. Going through all this stuff to be able to just be in that spot, in that time, in that place to have that amount of fellowship with that young man and, and his family and his mom was crying at the end of it his dad was crying at the end of it he goes that was it and he goes and if that's it then that's it and he goes and who the hell are you to question god <laughs> so he's getting his coat and bag and stuff he goes all right i'll talk to you in a little while <laughs> and i was like man i just got schooled by you did it was so cool i, I so. told him i go that's what it was all for we got the memo brother we want no god absolutely had his hand upon everything as he always does, no coincidences in the kingdom, as I always say. And he brought you into my life at that time. You didn't know when you were starting this case. And you were said, who's this Mel Chancey guy? Here's who he is. Didn't know me from Adam. And look at here we are. Uh, let's say I'm no mathematician, but 2004. <laughs> to, oh, 2024? 20, 20 years. Oh, yeah, that was an easy one. Okay, gotcha. 20 years later. I know. Minute, Brother, we're right? here with Pastor Steve and Dude, my 39-year friend that, uh, you know, walked onto a construction site one day and it was the, you know, we knew he was the pastor at Stone Church because our, our friend Merrill had owned the company. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, all right, guys, it's got to be P. That's right, I got it. It's got to be PJ, PG today. <clears throat> pastor Steve's coming out and I'm like, well, guys, we're going to do it with the warm cans of beer. They're going to hide him in the sod, right? You're telling us PG because we swear a little bit, but you're okay. And, um, I said, what's he doing out here? Well, he's building a new house. His family's out here. You know, he didn't do it for the money. We didn't make a lot of money back in that day. And he goes, he wants to come on. He's physical. He's a trooper, always trained and everything. And I go, there's something definitely wrong with him. It's 100 degrees out. We're slinging mud. And I'm talking about this crew worked. Even though you hear the stories of these guys drinking some beers, oh, we worked. Yeah. From sun up to sundown. Merrill was a workhorse. Merrill Healy was a workhorse. And we worked. And, uh, and that's how I got them at PS and, and here we I all think, are. I think a great story, Pastor, if you don't mind me jumping in, no, I was when he told him, I'm praying for you, when he was doing the whole angel thing. And he was like, he got mad at me. What are you doing that for? He got mad at me. So, he goes, you can't do it. You got, you got to stop it. <coughs> I'll never forget. We were down in the hole. And, uh, you know, he, he. so we'd been working together for a couple of years, and then he started, you know, 
Harry just started getting involved with another gang, motorcycle gang, and then he was moving on. And uh, I always told him ever since I first met him, I said, uh, I'm gonna pray for you. You get, you know, see his fur get up a little bit. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> but then he, he one time he told me he says, "You got to stop that." And I laughed at him. Right. Like, you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah. Praying for because I really believe that deep down inside, because of his mom and dad. There was a piece in him that, mm -hmm. that, that God had deposited something in every one of us. Sure. Um, and that was something that was just poking at that little spot. And that's why, you know, I let you guys talk. And that's why I wanted you guys to talk right now is so that I want all you guys to know that three of us were three sinners. We're, we're the Apostle Pauls. We're, <laughs> we're, we're the Peters. We're, we're King David. We're, we're, we're sinners. And the beautiful part of it is that we've been saved by grace. Not, not by any works, as Paul says, not by any works that we do with our own hands, but what the work was done on the cross of Calvary. And quite a while back, Mel and I were talking, and uh, I said, you know, it'd be nice to get some of us together and talk about only God. And, and th those moments in time when you can't, you can't deny that it was only God that put things together. So here's a little backstory. My wife and I came out to Chicago, it's 41 years ago now, came out to be youth pastors. And uh, my wife was pregnant with our, our first son and uh, we came out and, and became youth pastors. And then about a year later, because I was telling the guys earlier when we delivered food boxes, um, we didn't have a maternity insurance. And so I had to put our son on a credit card to get him out of the hospital. <laughs> Sometimes in hindsight. <laughs> you wish the card would have been. Yeah, I wish it would have right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. You got repo. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. I couldn't make the payment. Yeah, yeah they're <laughs> coming to get you. Uh, coming to get uh, you. It's been fun, though. <laughs> it has been fun. Yeah, but uh, so on, on my day off, uh, I'm a carpenter by trade. I'd either frame homes or then I met Merrill and poured concrete. So um, I would go to the job there. You guys remember working real close to the church. I'd go over like on a break or something, see you guys. And there's something about the smell of foreign oil. It, it just kind of attracts you. Yeah. But uh, some of you are like, I have no idea. That's okay. Yeah. But uh, but I, I met these guys and I started working with them. And um, for whatever reason, I, I look back and I, why did God put you there at 16 years old? in a hole with me, I'm 12 years older than you. Yeah. And your educational process um, had come to an abrupt end. Yes. <laughs> um, and so here you and I are in a, in a hole pouring concrete together. And I had that opportunity to begin to know Melvin. Yeah. And Melvin, the, the, the kid Melvin. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I look back and I go, God, that was no coincidence. And that's why when you ventured off the path and headed down a very hard road, you, you were talking to my wife and there will be a video of that, where you, know, you stopped coming around. Mm -hmm. that, always, that always broke my heart. But the thing was, I understood why you quit coming around. You didn't want to bring that influence yeah. you know, around us. Yeah. And, uh, but I never stopped praying for you. Never. So I'll never forget, I was walking through the Home Depot parking lot. And I once catering and the Gold's Gym was still there. Yeah. And some of you from the area don't know where it's at, but we remember it. And yeah. I have a bunch of two by fours on my shoulder. I'm going to my house, it's getting dark, dark out. And I hear a, a car, and I'm looking, these two headlights are coming right at me. And you know, yeah. I'm short and stocky. I'm built to run through things. Not, <laughs> I'm not built to jump over, over yeah. things. <laughs> and uh, this car comes screeching literally to my knees. And out comes, at that time you were about 280 pounds. Oh, yeah. You come yeah. roll. He did jump. I shouldn't have said he jumped out of the car. You rolled. He kind of rolled out of the car. <laughs> of, a, of a Corvette. Out of a Corvette that's about this far from the ground. And he's like, trooper. And I drop the two by fours. I go, Mel, we hug. And, and he goes, call Chira. They were across the street. And, she brought the kids over and we went to Iowans. Yeah, sure. we went to Iowans, yeah. And that was the day that he gave me his pager number. Mm -hmm. He says, Trooper, if you ever need anything, you know, here's my number. 
And uh, about a week later, I got literally out of a dead sleep at 2 in the morning. God woke me up to pray for milk. So I'm out, you know, down praying. And I'm thinking, if I'm up, he should be up. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if God's waking me up, right. uh, so right. I, I dialed his number. So it's when we had the house phones, you know? Yeah. So I dialed his number. I, you know, I put my number in, and I hang up. It was like 30 seconds. The whole house phone's ringing. I think every, all three of the phones in the house must be on super high volume. Because it's like, the whole house was shaking. So I grabbed the phone. He goes, Trooper, where are you, and what's the matter? I'll be right there. I said, no, everything's good. I, I said, I just want you to know that I'm praying for you, and that I love you. <clears throat> I said, I don't want to know where you're at, and I for sure don't want to know what you're doing. But I said, God woke me up. There was complete silence for a brief second. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, I love you, Trooper. There was so many times where Trooper would throw me that, I always want to say text, page. And I would say, you know, because, you know, we were night owls, right? You know, he was getting up at 4.30 in the morning, and I wasn't even home yet. And I would say... How can you know what we're doing? <laughs> we just didn't hit the news yet. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. 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 How, how, yeah. We just did something bad. Yeah. How does he yeah. know? Like, I'm unbelievable. And I'd say, okay, I'll call him tomorrow. Yeah. Or after my houses would get raided or something like that, and I'd make the news. I'm like, all right, let me, let me give a couple days, and I'll call a trooper and say hi. But God always yeah. put me on your heart. Yeah. And, and that's the amazing thing. And, and that's what I, I look at and I go, <clears throat> It just wasn't for me. My, my salvation, I didn't grow up in church. People think, well, you're a pastor, so you grew up in a Himalayan monastery wearing right. a brown robe with my head shaved bald and a <laughs> copied Bible with an eagle's feather and crane. <laughs> um, I, I didn't grow up in church. I never, I, I didn't go to church. Well, I had an early church experience. Uh, I think I got my first communion. I got my first communion. Then my parents got divorced and we're, we're you know, exiled. Came from a broken home, didn't see my dad for over five years. My mother was an alcoholic. Uh, I raised my little sister and tried to take care of my older sister who turned out into a drug addict. I didn't, I just knew the way of surviving. And I didn't go to church until I was 17 years old when I met who became my wife seven years later, Chira. And uh, the f we, we went on, a, the first date we went on, out on, she looked at me and she says, I just want you to know, I'll never love you or anybody else as much as I love Jesus Christ. I was like, whoa. <laughs> it's pretty heavy. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. talking, she's talking yeah. a lot, but I know, I, I know she was yeah. physically yeah. attracted yeah. to yeah. me. Check, please. But, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, wow. And, uh, but I, I didn't understand. I was thinking, you know, a G rated movie, Call the yeah. Wild right. by yeah. Disney. Yeah. And then Isley's to get burgers. Hope she didn't eat too much. And uh, yeah. I was on a very limited budget. Yeah. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. And then take her home. And, uh, and, and, but she told me about Jesus Christ. Didn't I never heard about mm -hmm. Jesus Christ? Yeah. What do you mean love? And and that's when that started the process in me of discovering who and what God wanted for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to know Christ, so we went out. It was November, and I gave my heart to Christ on March seventh, nineteen seventy-five. And during that that period of time, I discovered. Christ, I discovered how much God loved me. I discovered John 3, 16. Mm -hmm. For God so loved Steve. Right. And so when I took that, when I accepted Christ in my life, um, I, I, I always thought, how many more Steves are out there? Mm -hmm. You know, that no one bothered to either take the time to tell them, was afraid to tell them, or didn't think they were worthy to be told. Yeah. And so my, I think God stirred in me always was my salvation wasn't just for me to hang on to it for me, mm -hmm. that it was to be shared. Mm -hmm. And I've been rejected and I've been accepted because mm -hmm. I've shared Christ with people, but I don't care. Yeah, right. And, <clears throat> and so when I'm in a hole with him <laughs> and I'm, I think, okay, well, for whatever reason, God put the two of us together. Yeah. This is an opportunity to share Christ with him, which I did. Yeah, you did. You were starting to get into weightlifting and stuff. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I'm going to be big. And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you're going to die big. And you're yeah. like, why do you have to be <laughs> like that with me? Why do you always have to say <laughs> stuff like that to me? And I said, yeah. I'm just concerned about you, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, But you look at it, 
And, and I look at, you know, we have our three kids, we have five grandchildren, and I see how their lives are affected by the ch uh, choices of serving Christ that my wife and I made. And then I look at Melvin, and then I look at Melissa, and I see how God eventually brought that together. And then I see you and, and Chris and Tina, and then th you just start seeing things spawning off, and yeah. it's just, our salvational experience isn't just for us. Right. And <clears throat> people think that when they come to Christ, it makes them perfect. And like I said earlier, we're not perfect. Yeah, right. We're not perfect. Our wives. So moving on. <laughs> They're close. <laughs> well, they They're the closest list. thing we could probably Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And we're, we're in their lives to help them reach perfection. Yeah, that's a good Is that a good yeah, I think that's a good one. Well, iron <laughs> sharpening iron. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Very good one. Right. Good one. And yeah, uh, I like that one. I love that one. So good one. Don't edit that one out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see, you just look at it, and, and I see, you know, then when we, boxes of hope, and that's where you came up, where you and Melissa were able to come up for yeah. a few days for the boxes of hope. And I see, we started the firehouse 22 years ago, and we see how God's just expanded it. Yeah. But then we see the boxes of hope, and we see all this, and it's just look at what God's doing. Those are those only God oh, moments. Absolutely, absolutely. You, know? And, uh, you know when people say, "Well, the moon lined up, and the stars yeah. lined yeah. up, and the universe, right?" Yeah. And I'm always I let yeah. them finish what they're saying, and I go, "Yeah, I go, all right." So who created the universe and hung the stars, right? Right. It's God. God had His hands in everything that was going on, and we did not know that at the time. I didn't know that with you, you know. No. I always say pouring concrete head to head, especially when you're pouring footings. One guy's on one side, one guy's on the other, and you're slinging that. Sometimes the truck could only get, you know, 50 feet away from us, and we had to shovel all that down. We made an assembly line. Well, me and Trooper were probably the only ones on the crew at the time that were drinking all the oh, there. So <laughs> the other sure. guys smelled like butt yeah. Budweisers uh, all the time. Yeah, the cans of, cans sweat, of old style. Right, right. Sweat, yeah. Sweating it out. So I'm like, yeah. true pair of me and you will partner up on the wall or partner yeah. pair. And yeah. he was, you know, able to talk to me. Chara's brother Tommy was on the crew at the time. He was a year or two older than me. So we had, you know, me and him were the youngsters, and you know, the, the other guys were all 10, 12, 15 years older than us. Yeah. I mean, it was very young. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy were very young yeah. in that crew, right? And um, and he got to talk to me and speak to me. And, you know, I've always had my mother and father and my family praying for me and stuff, you know. And then once they seen me, you know, I remember coming to Merrill and saying, well, I think I was about 18 now and going into 19. I go, well, Merrill, you know, and I was Merrill's little boy, you yeah, know, you say, I was like his real brother, that little brother he took under the wing. And sometimes he'd, I, I'd run from him because he was a big, stock, Merrill's a big stocky guy. I he mouth could, off to he him. Could remember, he could wheel a whole wheelbarrow full of concrete with one hand. With one, one hand. One hand. Oh, That's it's a lot of torque. Sure. Yeah. And he took me under his wing and I'd pour side jobs with him and everything like that. It really taught me the ropes of concrete, which I became very good at. I became a good finisher. Yeah, I you became did. good. He, like, I, he'd send me out. Okay, I want you to, we'd have like my own little crew, right? And I came to him and I said, oh, Merrill, I got some news. I want to sit down and tell you, you know, I'm... Uh, um, you know, if you need me for two, three more weeks, four more weeks at tops, you know, I'm going to be calling it a day. I'm retire. He goes, what? <laughs> like, you, are, who are you going to work retiring. for? Who are you going to work for? I said, I'm not going to go work for nobody. I'm not yeah. leaving you because I'm going to work for somebody. I go, I'm just quitting. I said, I've got another way to make some money and uh, I'm starting a drug empire. And he goes, <laughs> what? And I go, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I was starting to get with the club, you yeah, know, yeah, and we were yeah. entering. I said, oh, this yeah. is what I'm doing. The boys taught me a little how I can make money. Yeah. And when I started making the same amount of money I'm doing out here for 50, 60 hours a week, busted my rear end, I'm, I'm out. And they, he was like, just looked at me like, and yeah. they're starting the journey. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing that I always had that solid prayer support. We always talk about the power of prayer, and I yeah. say in everything we're talking about, that's not just a cliche. No, there's power in prayer. No, it shows God never quits. Never prayers. quits, and boy, never have quits. I seen it. Time, and we gotta be careful. Yeah, we yeah. gotta be careful not to give up on people. Mm -hmm. it, it, so I'm clear. I wasn't always thrilled with what he did. In no. fact, I was probably on your side. Absolutely. Like bust him right. and bust yeah. him hard. Yeah. Because that that's needed. Yeah. Right? I, I wish he wasn't involved in all that stuff. But well, we don't all get the memo. Right. And that's I wasn't so. going to stop praying for him. Right. 
I had people leave our church because they found out the relationship that him and I had. Yeah. And I said to them, very politely, don't let the door hit you in the rear end on the way out. No, I had the Be same thing with, with when I vouched for them. Yeah. The the day, they were like, right. what are you doing? It's going to be egg on your face at the end of the day. I'm like, ah, I think it'll be okay. Yeah, this is exactly. Because, because it's called being secure in your faith and secure in yourself. Right. I, I'm going to, you can't stop me from praying for him. Right. You can't stop me from loving him. You can't stop me. It doesn't mean, like my mother, uh, you met mom, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. mom, yeah. 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 Uh, mom was an alcoholic. Um, drink any man under the table. <laughs> Literally. She could drink any man under the table. And when she get drunk, man, she get she crazy. And her accent? Yeah, her accent, but she get crazy. Like, yeah. you know, crazy. Whiskey crazy. Yeah, but she would always, she, would, she had an accent. None of us knew where she got this accent from. You know, some some people go to the dentist, get knocked out, they wake up with an accent. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just saying. My... She had an accent, and she she would say to me growing up, "Oh, Stephen, this is her accent, yeah. just so you know." Okay. Oh, Stephen, I love you, but I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, hey, "All right, good yeah, enough." Yeah. Good okay, enough. mom, and yeah. you know, and it wasn't until later on that I really began to understand. It's like, okay, I, I I'm gonna love you because God put that in my heart. It doesn't mean I'm gonna like everything you do. Right. Same way with God. God loves me. But I know for sure he doesn't like everything I do. Yeah, right. And we can't, I tell people all the time, sometimes you just need to shut your mouth and go to prayer. Go to prayer. And let God deal with the person that you're lifting up before the Lord. Because anything I said to him, or anything Chira would say to him, we knew he, he didn't he didn't run away from us. It was it was there, but something needed to get it down deep, and that was the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that only comes about, as it says, and we were just talking about, it was in Matthew 17, 21, or 20, remember? No, 19. 19. Yeah, 19. Yeah. Where it says, some things only come about with much prayer and fasting. Yeah. And we think it's rub a dub dub thanks to the grub and move on. And right. it's, uh, mm -hmm. oh, I lift up Melvin to you, amen. Yeah. No, you have to, and you talked about it with Chira, and you know from being in the career that you're in, uh, when the fight's on, you don't fold your arms and just yeah. that, that's not fighting that's get, you're going to get killed <laughs> right. yeah. or you're going to retreat and the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of darkness and evil wickedness in high places so there was times I I can't grab him not because he's bigger than me just I, I couldn't wouldn't matter if I grabbed him it sure. wouldn't matter if I yeah. beat his head against the wall it wouldn't matter this, it was a spiritual battle that, that, that raged over him and I had to go to God with the same intensity that you would go at in your job, you would go at in yours. I had to go with the same intensity in prayer and wait before him, as I have done for many people in our family, uh, people in my life at the, at the firehouse, we have a thing called the empty chair. The, the person that we are praying for, or persons, that will one day f not only fill the church, the seat of church, but will enter the kingdom of God because we await God to move in their life. Yeah. And that that's what that's what grips my heart. Yeah. And that's what grips you guys. And that's yeah. and I see that spreading like the, the the acquaintances that you know and you know and you see you know just hearing some of the guys that you know now are coming to church and how that that, that works amazing or what? It's, <laughs> yeah, and and I would say this to church, you you might look at somebody that you see at church going, they're here. Oh, I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, they're saying the same thing about you. Oh, can you believe they're here? Yeah. Because people come up. They get some nerve. Yeah. Did you, did you see so and so? I'm like, yeah. They just walk out and go, hey, did you see you? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's amazing. It's yeah. the power Absolutely. of prayer, and it's the relentlessness of it you can't yeah. stop right you can't stop and I, I, I've seen it not only in my own life and I now I've been seeing it in so many people's lives that reach out and become part of the John 316 devotional team we got some heavy hitters on this team I was saying yeah. earlier in a devotional you yeah. know no doubt. we got some heavy hitters we got a slew of, of, of ex motorcycle club guys we have some mobsters, we have some street gang members and stuff and uh, that I've fellowshiped with for the last, you know, yeah. four years with the team. And I said, boy, 
if you line these giants up shoulder to shoulder, that's right. some, there's some tough characters there that wanted to know the love of the Lord, right? And the great and, uh, message that you give is, again, you know, God does not quit. He doesn't yeah. give up on you. And if yeah. you can go out, profess your faith, have an understanding, explain your relationship with God, it gives other people hope. If Mel Chancey can make that change, certainly I can. Certainly I'm worthy. If Mel Chancey's worthy, then certainly I'm worthy. You know, and it's just that it's bringing those people to that, that God hasn't quit on you, man. Don't quit on yourself. Right. Me and Jared were sitting here a little earlier in a, in a video, both well, you guys will see, and we were talking about just that, about people will hit me up and they'll say, you know, Mel, they'll DM me, they said, we, we just think that we, we went too far. Yeah. We're too far gone to have a relationship with yeah. the Lord. We just don't, I, we did too much. And now tell them, to, please call me. Here's my phone yep. number, call me. And you know, they jump right on the phone and call me up. And I go, you know who you're talking to, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I you broke every rule that could yeah. be possibly broken in, in when, it's, when it comes to not abiding by God's law, mm -hmm. right? I broke it all. I went through a checklist. Okay, this, right. here's the Ten Commandments. Let me break every day. And I start to tell them that, and I fellowship with them that. And I go, no one's too far gone. Yep. You can't clean yourself up first and come to the Lord, because you're never going right, right. to get gonna that clean. Him. You have to come to him as you are and say, well, here I am, right. and self-surrender. And I get the joy of telling people, because I went through this step by step. When I thought I self-surrendered, I wanted to hold a little bit of yeah. the old Mel back a little right. bit, right? And I said earlier, and the last thing I self-surrendered was the womanizing. I kind of held that extra long. And you have to self-surrender. You have to continue to come to the Lord. I didn't get down on my knees and pray after the RICO indictment in that, in that, in that cold cell in February of 2005, and I got the key the next day, and you were like, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. hey, have a good time. Good guy, yeah. man, you want home. Yeah. Go watch Joe. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, um, it, it's, you, you have to keep coming back to him. And I like to explain to people, they say, how do I pray? How do I have a relationship with the Lord? Just like you do with your best friend. You're not just calling them up when you need something. Right. Hey, Chris. Hey, Trooper. I just need this. Talk to you guys in a year. Right. I call them up all the time. How are you guys doing? doing? You guys doing okay? What's going on? I love yeah. you guys. But, you know, have that relationship with the Lord. There's no right way to pray. He knows your heart. Speak exactly. to him. He knows. Look, when he was here, when, when Christ walked the, the earth here, he hit everybody that was a sinner. Right. <laughs> you know? He hit everybody that was a sinner, right? Right. Saul into, uh, into Paul. I mean, he, he had his, he selected them guys, you know, so it's, it's, it's open your heart to the Lord. It's so easy to do. I mean, if, if I'm sitting here, the king of the knuckleheads, it, it, it's just showing that it's easy. He, he loves us all. He died on the cross for us all. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to die here for, but I'm excluding these 14,000 people or whatever it might be. He died for us all. And, you know, it's a blessing when we get that memo. We don't know when that day is going to be, you know, to come. My father-in-law, you know, God rest his soul, you know, he didn't have a relationship with the Lord all his life. And I was in his life for how many years, baby, before Pops passed? Eleven. Eleven years. And, you know, he's seen how I was with his daughter and mm -hmm. me knowing the Lord. But when he got sick and his time was coming... Pastor Stephen Chair happened to be coming up for a visit with us, and he said, "I want to. We want to go see Bob. You know, want to see him." He goes, "And I'm going to ask him if he wants to accept Christ in his life." And I just didn't think he was going to say yes. I really didn't. Yeah. I just didn't. And um, he did. Yes, yeah. he we did. went into that hospital room, and he still made it months. He wasn't dying yeah. that day, so it ain't like he wanted to do it. Like, hey, I'm checking out in ten seconds. Right. Let me call in the name of the Lord. If we could all do that, well, right. you were I pinching these two. I was pinching these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If we could all do that, and we knew the date, I'd have still been doing it. Right. I'm gonna hang on till the very last second. Let me run around and be a maniac. But right before I, I'll yeah. get ready to go. Okay, Lord, yeah. forgive me. Yeah. Right. We do. It's the glory about faith. Yeah. We don't know when it's happening, right? right. And I watched my father-in-law accept Christ, and and then have that peacefulness about him. And I asked him later. He goes, you know. I know I, I did a lot of bad things in life. I go, Pop, would you break a window or two? Yeah, right. like, bad yeah, things yeah, compared yeah, to what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? like, I think I hit the checklist of bad things. <laughs> and he goes, so, you know, I, I'm going to be in heaven. I go, you know you are. What do we tell you? The Bible says you, you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. I go, he's going to have a job for you. And he goes, I think I'm going to probably be running the elevator. 
Because I'm probably going to be like, just, you know, I'm going to have the lowest job. I go, whatever job you have, Pops, guess what? You're doing it in the presence of the Lord. So if you're digging a ditch, hopefully that won't happen. Right? If we got to go up there and God says, hey, Mel, I need you on the concrete team. Yeah. I'm going to go, for real? Come on, Lord. Like, you know, you got a sense of humor. So nobody is ever too far gone. Uh, absolutely. And that's the thing. And uh, this past Sunday, I, at the end of the sermon part, I'm talking about uh, strongholds in our life. And um, one of the things about the firehouse, why we started the firehouse, why God called us to start the firehouse, is we, we're not just a church for the saved. We're a church for, we're a rescue station. We're there for people that don't know Christ, to tell them about Christ, to show them the way. We're there for people who know Christ. If they want to come and share their faith and work hard, like they do for the Box of Hope or our missions or whatever, that's what that's why we're there. That's what God's called us to. But at the end of the sermon, I'm talking about different strongholds. And one that, that I said was, uh, one of the strongholds of people's lives is damaged goods. They consider themselves damaged. So therefore, when they're damaged, nobody wants them. They're discarded. You, you get a dent in something, you throw it away. You don't get it fixed. Or, you know, it's no good. Right. The enemy tries so hard to get us all to the place where because of our choices, we, nobody's made the perfect choice. I mean, our wives did when they married us. That's was. I agree. Yeah, so, but, I'm uh, yeah, that was easy one. but uh, nobody makes the right choices all the time. So some of the, yeah, granted, some of the choices we make leave bigger ripples than others. Mm -hmm. But God, God's the one that died for the damaged goods. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To make them whole. And you see it's good. You guys are getting to see it right now. You know, me not living here and yeah. you attending the firehouse on Sunday. You know, it's been, uh, it's been great. It's been wonderful to meet Pastor Steve, his family. I mean, we could not have fallen into a better church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we, you know, i tell you what, it's, uh, cause we, we've been to different churches and stuff and we were very secure in our faith for ourselves, but just. We didn't really find it. I just, I don't know. It's something about being at the firehouse, brother. It's exactly where we need to be. And as my wife would say, it's the Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. That brings it together. Yeah. She just six, yeah. six times. Yeah. 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 We sat down for your yeah. first sermon when you went up and you went. Six Super Bowl rings, and my wife goes, uh, They're fine. You I you. like him, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. We're coming back here next Sunday and for every Sunday. Well, how about if I do this at the end, and because this will go on our YouTube channel. By the way, I've always wanted to do this. Subscribe here. Yeah, in the link right that's here. Where you, yeah, that's where you do it. Subscribe here. Yeah, that's how you do it. Ring the button or something. <laughs> we got sixteen followers. <laughs> but I want to give us. An, we're gonna pray. Yeah. And if you're at home and you don't know Christ, I want you to pray this. I want you to pray this prayer. If you don't live near us, you need a church. Find a church. Watch us every week. If you're, if you're around here, check out our website, firehousechapel.org. We'd love to have you. But I want to give you the opportunity. If you don't know Christ in your life, as I didn't at one time, and now I guess not only am I the oldest individual here, I am also the oldest in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then Chris had to come to the place. Melvin had to come to the place. If you don't know Christ, I want to pray with you. So if you want to pray with me, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If this is something you want to do, this is the beginning of the process. You're going to release your heart into the hands of God, and God's going to enter your life. And when I tell you that he can make you whole, I'm promising you he can make you whole. When he can forgive you of all your sin, he forgives you all of your sin. If you think you're damaged, he'll make you. He'll fix you the way you should be. So let's pray together. Repeat after me if you want to, to, to accept it. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. You see my heart. You see the sin. You see where I'm at. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. And I give you my spirit. Jesus, come into my life and become my Savior and my Lord. I receive you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hope that helps. Yeah. Thanks, brothers, for being here. Love to have you sometime. God bless. I tell everybody this, if you said that prayer from your heart, 
Tie your shoes up. Exactly. Yeah, strap you're in. You're strap in. You're getting ready for an amazing ride when when the Lord starts changing your life. It's amen. And check out Melvin's uh, Instagram account, um, Mel Chancy, right? And oh, yeah, Mel Chancy three sixteen. We do the devotionals, the yeah. John three sixteen devotional team Monday through Friday, and uh, and we participate here in the boxes of both yeah. feeding these children. So it's just amazing, you guys. So God bless. Love you guys. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. That's awesome. Right. That's awesome.